This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Use the promo code LASTAPRIL and get a droplet for free for two months and buy Ting. Go to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 31, Episode 7, a.k.a. Episode 307. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt, good morning to you. Good morning. Are you ready for me to let everybody know about the big show today? Oh, yeah. All right, well, coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, we're going to revisit Sabian Linux. Now, we reviewed this distribution back in 2012, and we thought, let's see where this has gone since then. It's a rolling distribution that matches source packages and binary packages. It lets you mix and interchange them, built on top of Gentoo. And we're going to revisit that in the second half of the show. In the news segment, we're going to talk about Ubuntu 1 shutting down Linus and System D guys getting a little bit of a fight, (laughs) a little bit of a, you know, hubbub back and forth. And also uh, on Thursday, Linus held a QA and a at the Portland Linux Users Group, a really, really, really good Q&A. And uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, be allowed to restream it. I recorded some of the highlights, and we're going to play a couple of those in this week's episode of Linux Action Show. And then, of course, link you to their full talk in our show notes, what nice. I, which I absolutely recommend you download. Yeah. It was one of Linus's best Q&As I've heard in a long time. So we'll play highlights from that, and we're also going to talk about a few other things. But first, first. Matt... It is our picks. All right. And as is tradition, we start with our Runs Linux, this pick. And I picked this one for two reasons. I I have a little soft spot for cryptocurrencies, even if they're crazy. Crazy. And, uh, of course, this is also, this has a local angle to it. So check it out, Matt. Uh, Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. I present you the man who wants to mint 10% Mm -hmm. of all new Bitcoins, Runs Linux. Wow. He has a massive server farm. Um, built of, I guess you could call it servers, from Raspberry Pis. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. They're compact, so you can really stuff them in there. Yeah, and he says, uh, it's, so check this out, Matt. It's in a couple of large buildings near the Columbia River in eastern Washington. So it's right in our backyard. Cool. Where hydroelectricity is cheap and plentiful. Mm-hmm. Dave Carlson oversees what he says is one of the largest Bitcoin mining operations on the planet. At any given time, Carlson's goal is to account for 7 to 10% of the entire world's Bitcoin mining as measured by processing or hash power, he said. Wow. At the moment, he's slightly below the target, but that doesn't, he doesn't expect that to remain that way for very long. The operations are fueled by thousands of mining rigs containing 1.4 million bit furry or Fury. <laughs> Bit furries. I know. Uh, chips. Well, Raspberry Pi is loaded with custom softwares, direct tra- traffic on each rig. Now, there's some really great pictures if you're watching the video version. Uh, he says Boy. here we, we plan to surface about half of the U.S. mining power is something you can purchase on a least hash product, so you can actually Whoa. buy some hashing oh time. Oh, my God. Like, oh my, it, it's, like, it's, it's like buying like a gold right? mine. I was yeah. just about to say, it's yeah. like it's totally get a miner's hat and a yep. little pickaxe. Yep. You're good to go. You buy shares into a gold mine. Here's oh, uh, Here he that. is in his setup right here. Look at this. I see. Now, that, that I can see myself doing because I can get my brain around it. It's like... He's doing it. I can right. get into that. And this That's is cool. his this is his setup here and this That's is like their data cool. center. And you can see he's wearing a coat because right? he's probably he's got, got it cool. pretty well cool. Yeah. Uh, our our local uh, news agency, Como Four, did a little story on here. I'll play a clip of it. Interesting. And that's the promise of tomorrow that has Dave Carlson. Wow. <laughs> Here it is. Going big. Look at that. Really you see big. The fan of- that's impressive. This is a rare exclusive yeah. behind the scenes look at one of the biggest. Bi- so if you want to watch that video, I'll probably wow. get pulled down from YouTube for playing it. But if you want to watch it, you can. we'll have it. It's in the show uh, links. Uh, so he's soon opening up a third facility in Washington. Maybe he's hiring. I should come. Or you know what? Oh, we, right. we should get in there and see this. Oh, if he's in dude, Washington. That would be amazing. We should get in there. We'd totally drive down and do uh, that. The, the, uh, the current rigs each contain 16 boards, each mm-hmm. board containing 16-bit Fury chips for a total of 256 mining chips on each rig. About 90,000 processor boards have been deployed. Um, and he, I can't remember. I think in, in this article, it's a two-page article. Let me jump over to the second page. I think maybe in here they talk about what version of Linux it is. Uh, and the other thing they talk about, too, is that he has, like, a, look at all these That's pictures. So look cool. at these. How oh, awesome man. is that, right? I want to. I just want to go and just check it out, you know? I know. I want to just walk through there. Right. Uh, I'm trying to find, he, they, they, well, he also talks about one of the ways he distributes the workload is he has, uh, here we go. Uh, this is, oh, this is about, he spent about a million building the existing facility. Wow. Um, and his next one's going to be, uh, he's going to spend $3 million on the hardware itself. Rent mm-hmm. is 8000 a month. Power is 40000 oh, a month. Crap. Oh, my 40000 in power, and he's getting it from cheap hydro. Yeah. 
He says, I think we spent probably three to five million dollars on the total operation. It's paid for itself off in bitcoins many times over already, though. Wow, that's so awesome. Trying to, oh, here we go. Um, God, that's crazy. Before the Raspberry Pis uh, jump into action, a separate cluster of Linux servers that run the Bitcoin node software talk to the Bitcoin network to find out what the current target is. The cluster relays that information to the individual Raspberry Pis, and that directs traffic to each rig. Then the chips start hashing. So oh, the, so the Pis are running Linux, and then he has a cluster of servers running Linux that sort of are like the traffic cops. So he should be really doing planned that out. So yeah. he's getting maximum efficiency. That's that is, really smart. So there you go. Boy. Uh, I, 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 uh, I'd like to see that. I, I, I'd if like he, to own that. If he happens to, <laughs> you know? Mr. Carlson, if you happen Ooh. to be a viewer of the Linux Action wow. Show or anybody who works with you, is uh, contact we us. We would love to check that out. It's just it's yeah. it's literally like going into Candyland for us. I mean, Chris at JupiterBroadcasting.com. Mm -hmm. Call me. Let's make it happen. All right, Matt. Well, uh, before we go any further into our picks this week, I want to thank a brand new sponsor to the Linux Action Show, yes. and that is DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Now, folks in our community have got these things up and going in about 47 seconds, but I'm, just so you don't feel bad, I'm going to say 55 seconds. And pricing Woo. plans start only $5 a month for 512 megabytes of RAM, 20 gigabyte SSD, a CPU, and one terabyte of transfer. But here's the best part. We're going to get you two months for free when you get that $5 rig when you use the special promo code last April. All one word, last April. That lets them know you heard about it here on the show and you appreciate nice. them becoming our brand new sponsor. And it gets you two months of the DigitalOcean droplet for free. And you can really check it out and see what you can do with it. Try out their awesome dashboard, their cool control panel. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. Their interface is simple. They have an intuitive control panel, and power users can actually replicate that on a larger scale with their straightforward API. I've been told the API is beautiful. Now, if you're watching the video version here, you can see this is actually the screen where you create a droplet on DigitalOcean. So I'm going to put in last April, our promo code, and then I just choose... What I what type of what size of machine I want, yeah. and it's very straightforward. It's not confusing. There's no hidden costs. You can you immediately know how much your cost is going to be and what you're going to get for that. And it's it's a very easy tier. Five dollars is the first rig. Next rig next rig is ten dollars. Next oh, rig after cool. that is twenty dollars. It's very sequential. Yeah, it makes a lot of you. sense. Yeah. So I'm going to choose. And you can also pick your uh, region. I'm going to choose the $5 nice. one, because that's okay. free with that last April promo code. Sure. Then I choose my region. I'm going to say, this time I'm going to do San Francisco. I already have a droplet in New York, which is great when I'm distributing files, because I can distribute them on the West Coast ah, and the East Coast this way. Right. Then I go down here, and I can choose my distribution. They've got Ubuntu, and they have all tons of flavors of Ubuntu, from 13.10 to 12.04, even 10.04, 32-bit. It kind of depends on your needs. Mm -hmm. They have CentOS, of course, and they have a lot of options there. Debian, obviously. Nice. The one I'm using, and have had tons of success for with is Arch Linux. Oh. And the great thing about this is this is giving me super current packages for the things I need, right. like uh, Quasal Connect and, uh, and BitTorrent Sync and things like that that I'm running on my droplet 24-7. And with their snapshotting system, if I'm worried that maybe some big update's going to break something, yeah. I can take a droplet snapshot and revert back if anything breaks. They oh, make it that's really fantastic. easy. Yeah. And then they're also working with uh, Doku, which is an open source uh, project that is contributing to the Docker project. Mm -hmm. So DigitalOcean is uh, they're one of the main people behind Doku, which they've open sourced. And what it lets you do is deploy applications inside a Docker instance. And uh, DigitalOcean is massively excited about Docker, just like I am. Yeah. And so here, here's the screen where you could say, I want to put a LAMP stack on Ubuntu 12.04. I want to do Docker on Ubuntu 13.10. Uh, you have all of these WordPress, Ubuntu 13.10, just one deployment. Wow. And the other thing that's really nice is if you have stored images, you could redeploy one of your stored images. And if you've already got a whole bunch of stuff set up on that, you're up and running in seconds with a fully ready to go rig. So if you have a droplet like on the East Coast and you're like, you know, I want to duplicate that yeah. on the West Coast or in another country or whatever. Just take maybe. an image of it and then redeploy Oh. that image on the uh, on the West Coast. The other thing that's really nice is they have an HTML5 uh, console, so you can get console access of the machine. You can see everything that's happening, console out logs, and it's right there. It's, it's, oh, it, they, they embed an HTML5 VNC object and actually expose the console log. And what's so awesome about all of this is it's sitting on top of these SSD drives, so it's crazy fast. It's tier one bandwidth. DigitalOcean has partnered with some of the best connection providers in the industry, and it all runs on top of KVM on Linux boxes. That's so, so awesome. DigitalOcean is the perfect sponsor for the Linux Action Show. So please go over to digitalocean.com, use that promo code last April, and say thank you for supporting part of the Linux. Uh, this is another part of the community they're now right? supporting. They're now supporting the Linux Action Show as part of their overall contribution to the community. I appreciate that. I think they're a wonderful fit Definitely. for our show. And I hope you go over there, try out that promo code last April. And even if you're just experimenting and learning, 
It's a great value. And if you then move that into something in production, mm-hmm. some of the biggest sites on the web run on digital ocean droplets. Oh, that's amazing. And it's, you know, the promo code's so easy. It's last April, one word, yep. done. Easy. And you get two months of uh, the $5 droplet for free. Nice. So a big thank you to Digital Ocean for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Glad to have you guys. Woo. And uh, thanks, everybody, thanks. for uh, take, checking out our sponsor, DigitalOcean.com. So cool. Yes. Okay, Matt, I've got a pick for you okay. that might tickle uh, your way back bone. Uh, I like getting my way Do back. You, let's tickled. see if I can. Let's see if I can find a <laughs> screenshot of it. It's a Google product that was shut down, uh, oh, geez. and there was a lot of people <laughs> crazy, crazy enthusiastic uh, about it. Uh, do you remember good old Google Wave? Do you remember that? Yeah, Did you ever I play with Google Wave? Wave? Yeah. Uh, not really. I didn't play much with it just because I never really. I, I think the biggest problem is people didn't understand really what the hell you're supposed to do. Yeah. With it. It, you know, you kind of need to have a reason to have a collaborative editor. Right. It, it, you know, it's 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 Google Docs uh, sits on top of an XMPP backend mm-hmm. that has HTML fields and gadgets you can drop in there. And right. the gadgets could be like actual like little mini applications and whatnot. A lot of people loved it. I loved it for show collaboration. It was oh, an I awesome bet. way to like have idea boards on the web that uh, yeah. was cross-device and actually had tons of functionality and could tie in with some really handy Google services, too. Well, you know, for various reasons, and probably to focus on Google Docs, Google shut it down. Ah. They didn't kill it, though. They, they open sourced it. I think we probably all probably remember that. It went to the Apache Foundation, and it is now living on at the in one of the incubators over at the, at the Apache Foundation. You can find it at incubator.apache.org slash wave. We'll have it linked in the show notes. And it, they, have, uh, they have something they offer called Wave in a Box. Oh, and Wave cool. in a Box is a, is, a, uh, is a binary. I haven't done it on this machine yet. I'm going to show okay. you the web demo. But from what I read on their site, it is a binary you download that you run, and it's a server component and all of that. And you get, quote, unquote, Wave in a Box. And they're currently working on making it. It's, you know, it's slow going, but it's actually usable. Uh, and so here is a waveinabox.net. Oh. This is waveinabox.net is their demo site where you can check it out, create an account. And here I made a like a little you know example prep doc for right. last 307. You can see I put our show description in there. So you got like your header. You put got some your, links yeah. in there. I did like it shows you could do some diagramming, which is really nice when you're collaborating this with folks. This looks like it would be really cool for show notes. You can yeah, you can embed images, you can mm-hmm. embed code. Uh, and they have, just like uh, Google Wave did one of my favorite things, is, this can be hit and miss, but you sure. can embed all of these gadgets. So here's a mind map. Oh, so the gadgets an actual didn't make map. it through. Okay. So like if mm-hmm. we wanted to, so say we had a Wave doc open making plans for Linux Fest Northwest. Right. Well, one of the things we could have in our Wave document is the map location for Linux Fest Northwest, oh, right? right? So everybody right. working on it would, would be know where to go. Yeah. Uh, you can insert uh, images like I've done, YouTube video, all kinds, uh, straight up HTML, iframes. So it lets you do all of that hmm. that you used to be able to do in the old wave. And there's not as many, but there's still a ton of great ones. It lets you do rich text. Uh, it's interactive. And if you can run it on your own box, you can, you know, you know it's private as well. And yeah. it's, Oh, and that's a big selling point. Yeah. You know, that's mm-hmm. that for me. See, we are currently using, like, Google Spreadsheets and Google Docs. And it, yeah. it just really is not working great for us. It's working, but it's, a, it, you know, yeah. we really got to. It feels limited, and it feels like we could do better. And I yeah. think by going with this route... This would actually allow us to not only take our data back, right. but potentially add some new functionality well, that we really want. And the other thing, too, is like if I can run it on my own, I could throw it on a VPS. I could throw yes. it on a DigitalOcean That's droplet. Just say. Yep. Yeah, I could put it on my DigitalOcean droplet, and then I just say, okay, everybody, go to this address, and we can all work Boom. off of this. And and I I know like I know it's going to be up because the other problem we've had is sometimes on Mondays is Google Docs goes down right as Coda Radio is starting. It right. seems to be something that's happened a few times. Whereas this, you know, I wouldn't have that kind of same load scenario, so it wouldn't necessarily be a problem. I like it. Yeah. So that's Wave in a Box. You can see the demo at waveinabox.net, and you can download the binary over at incubator.apache.org slash wave. Link is in the show notes. See binary release right there. Nice. Very, yeah. very cool. Yeah. So I hope it continues on. I don't yeah. know. Well, it looks like it has an opportunity to. It's in an incubator. It's, you know, yeah. it's got the opportunity to kind of sit and stew and sift and dry out some stuff. I know that they, you know, they, they were... I, 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 I know that they have an active community, but it doesn't mm. seem like they're crazy, crazy active. I checked out their mailing list, and they're still around and talking and stuff. Right. Well, that's that's good signs of life. I've seen a lot of communities die. Yeah. Uh, so, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, I got a I got an interesting thing for our weekly spotlight. It's cool. being called the almost completely open source laptop. It's going on sale. It's the uh, Novena, I believe is how you say it. Mm-hmm. It's a 1.2 gigahertz ARM machine. Interesting. Uh, it's designed for users who care about open source and or want to modify and extend their hardware. So this isn't like oh, you know okay. an ultrabook like super low profile hip thing. Right. This exactly. is the down and dirty machine. All mm-hmm. documentation is public for the machine for the hardware. Of course, it runs Linux. So and, we would go so far as to say this is like a Stallman friendly. Uh, possibly, possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. uh, they're trying to raise money right now. They have a goal of uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, 
They've uh, reached 130. Now, when you buy, you get hardware at a discount. Here, I'll play a little bit of the ah, video so we can cool. find out about it. first started getting into hardware, something that really enabled me was the fact that I had schematics and source code to my Apple II. And I'm really excited to build a full open source laptop from the ground up with my own two hands. Everything from the circuit boards to the, to the, the chassis to the operating system level. I'm a big fan of open hardware. Uh, a few years ago, if someone presented you a scenario where perhaps you're worried about your hardware being modified as it's being shipped to you, they would say you're crazy, you should have a tinfoil hat. Turns out that uh, you're not that crazy. There's actually evidence lately uh, that, there, that that does happen. The latest revelations that have come out uh, from Edward Snowden talk about a secret workshop that would install chips into computers. If you can't hack it, you don't own it. So the device has basically the kitchen sink in terms of slots and ports. It's got two Ethernet jacks, SD card, wow. uh, micro SD, micro USB even, a couple USB ports, serial, a high speed expansion port for the FPGA, PCI Express, SATA, a custom power connector on the inside for expansion to a battery Look at board. That wood pretty much everything that a hacker would it's like all the to stuff use. Coming out the side of it. It's like, oh I love this wood chassis. So they're assembling it. We're excited to offer you four models yeah. of the Novena platform. There's going to be a bare board for people who just want to have the hardware and do what they want with it themselves. That's cool. There's going to That's be what we call cool. the desktop version, which is a bare board in a case with an LCD. That's cool. Tethered I, into I the wall. That. There's going to be a laptop version, which is the desktop version plus a battery and an SSD, so you can use it on the go. And there's Look also going to be an wall. airline version, so awesome. which is a beautiful handcrafted case. Wow. We invited a guest artist to go ahead and build it, Kurt Mottweiler. We gave him the open plans, and he came up with his interpretation of what he thinks a beautiful laptop case should be, and I think it's going to be outstanding. The hardware is ready for production, That's and if you cool. like what you're doing and you want to see more open hardware tools, please back us on Crowd Supply and spread the word. If you back us now, you receive a Novena at these special campaign prices. Thanks and happy hacking. So the prices are about 10% uh, lower than what they'll be once the uh, Kickstarter like campaign is over. Oh, so there's some motivation to get in now then. Pretty and, wild, you know, isn't it? You kind of almost want, I mean, just on principle, you'll want one, right? I mean, uh, so you can see you can buy just the board for 500 that's cool. The all-in-one desktop is uh, 1200 Laptop is two thousand, and that wood laptop is like a complete a full on laptop's five thousand yeah. dollars. Now it's not cheap, but yeah. and, um, and you're buying a, you're buying a boutique setup. I mean, you're not you're not trying to compete with Dell here. You're trying to do something very specific, and yeah. very important. I yeah. think. So. Uh, so let's talk a little bit, just so you know that I mean, those are some pretty crazy prices, but they're not yeah. necessarily skimping. It's it's going to have a, a quad core, a one point two gigahertz A nine ARM. Uh, 200 megabit ad uh, Ethernet adapters, not gigabit. It says 100 uh, megabit. Four gigabytes of RAM. Wow. Uh, they're, they, the promotional images have an SSD drive. They're going to be shipping a different SSD drive. The units that have the 13.3-inch uh, screen, it's no slouch. It's a yeah. uh, 1920 by 1080 full HD screen, the 13.3-incher. Nice. Uh, it's IPS, too. So it has great viewing angle. Uh, I just I'm pretty impressed by all this, well, and it's going to be a 240 gigabyte uh, SATA SSD. Well, and I think what's important is you know people have talked about open hardware for God like on the last five ten years even, um, and it's never really taken off. And one of the big areas we really need open hardware is on laptops. Jeez, I know. Way. I've always wanted to be able to build my own laptop, and you know it's always been kind of a it's kind of touch and go. This is a great opportunity. You know this could potentially build into something amazing over time. Yeah, and there's a lot of people who are creating applications for Linux on these devices. In yes. fact, in Linus's Q and A, one of the things that he talked about is like the amount of Linux now running on ARM devices. When you consider Android and all of the equipment out there, it just it just you know, dramatically dwarfs Linux on the desktop. Right. And uh, so there are a lot of people that are writing applications for Linux on these types of hardware, and this would be amazing for those kinds of guys and yeah. gals out there that are coding for those architectures. So it's a pretty cool project. And uh, we'll have a link in the show notes that if you want to help fund them on Crowd Supply, maybe check it out. If now the, you know the, the prices are kind of high because you get equipment, so yeah, it's like you, you're doing this because you're passionate. Yeah. about it. you're not doing this because you want to buy a new laptop. So you're doing it, this because you care about the cost. If you get one, yeah. you gotta let us know. And oh see please, it. you got it, and you gotta YouTube that bad boy. Yeah, yeah, and then send it into the show. Yes. All right, all right, Matt. 
Well, uh, I think, oh, oh, I oh, wanted oh. to mention, I knew there was something else. If if something like that happens, I want to just point out, we have a subreddit. Did you know about this? We do have a subreddit. And I, I have been failing to mention at the beginning of the show, and we always like to get folks to go over to linuxactionshow.reddit.com. And this would be a great example. Like, if you got one of these machines and you made a YouTube video, submitting that YouTube video to our subreddit is probably, like, the best way to make oh, sure yeah. we see it. Because I only am able to read a percentage of the emails that come in before the show. I try to read all email, but before the show starts, I only get to a percentage of mm-hmm. it. And if you send in via email... I may or may not see it, but if you submit it to that right. subreddit, it usually always surfaces to the show, and we it makes nice. you know it's visible to us. So LinuxActionShow.reddit.com is the perfect resource to contribute to the show, vote up, comment, things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, Matt, let's do the news. the news and this episode is brought to you by ting.com matt ting is mobile that makes sense ting is my mobile service provider and matt's mobile service yes. provider matt's rocking the note Where? and i'm rocking the nexus 5g's and what i love about the nexus 5 is this nice little led light down here just this really nice calm notification yeah. multicolored. uh so anyways it's really nice like i i think this is yeah, one of the great glide through get it done like for the for the value and all of that i think it's one of the greatest phones out there and then you combine it with the ting network and it's you're really cooking with gas because yes. Ting is you only pay for what you use. There's no contract, and there's no early termination fee. So when you get your device, you own it outright. And that's why I love the value of the Nexus 5 right there. But there's they have tons of great devices on the Ting network. And if you're in a contract right now, Ting can actually help you get out of that contract with their early termination relief program. They'll pay up to $75 per line that you have to get canceled. So go to last.ting.com. That's going to take $25 off your first device. Yeah. We just had a story written in by a viewer who uh, he had that. He got that. Uh, discount because mm-hmm. he brought a, a used device over to the Ting Network. They have a BYOD page you can check out. Okay. He brought his used device over. Because of that, he got $25 credit applied to his Ting bill. His first month, absolutely free. In fact, he had a little left over. Nice. Because Ting just takes your messages, your minutes, and your megabytes, and whatever bucket you fall into, that's what you pay. Well, if you're on a lot of Wi-Fi, like mm-hmm. I'm pretty much always on Wi-Fi these days, that means my data usage is pretty darn low. And they've just recently lowered the rates, too, so it's an even better deal, deal than it used to be. Right. But that's not just, it's not just that. I mean, like, I've... I just plugged Matt's uh, phone bill that he used to have on, in here, and we just went through the numbers right Boom. there. Matt's saving uh, $2,100 in two years by switching to Ting. Makes sense. It's uh, They have a savings calculator. You can go plug in your bill information and then see how much money you would save. And you can see how not only do you pay for the mobile device, but you change the whole model up where the value is all right there. It's all captured immediately mm-hmm. for you, and then you are put in the position of power. And the great thing about that is if you ever get stuck, like if you're like, geez, this is a great service, but I ran into a couple of snags, Ting backs it up with incredible customer service. Service. You can call them at one eight five five Ting FTW anytime between eight a.m. and eight p.m. Eastern, and a real person will answer the phone. And people are always surprised when I say this, but they like they actually answer the phone right away, yeah, and oh, they totally. actually solve the problem. And they know what yeah, they know what they're talking about. Instead of like saying, "Oh, hang on, let me get my script," I mean, they can actually right. have a dialogue right. with you and solve your issues. Yeah, and they feature a lot of them on their blog too. Yes. And so you start with six dollars; it's a flat six dollars, and it's just your usage on top of that. There's a lot of good things coming to Ting all the time as well. Not only new devices, but they just rolled out Amazon Payments. So now you can pay your Ting bill with an Amazon Payments account. So if you have an Amazon Payments nice. balance, nice. or you know, if you have a little affiliate program that's making you some Amazon revenue, you could just use that to pay your Ting bill. And since your Ting bill is, you're just paying for what you use. That could be an incredible value. That's a big value. Yeah. I mean, that could be huge. for You could. I mean, you, you might almost be walking away every month with a free phone, depending on what your affiliate revenue no is. No kidding, right? So you can find more information about that on the Ting blog. Go to last.ting.com to get started. Let us know you heard about here on the show. You appreciate them supporting us. And click that savings calculator while you're over there. Just try it out. It's right there on the, on the in the middle of the page. And just put your information in there and see if that kind of gets you interested. Because it sure woke me up when I saw that. Definitely. That's why I've been using Ting for over a year. So a big thank you to Ting. Last.ting.com. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Ting. Big thank you. Love those guys. Uh, all right, Matt. Okay. So uh, this week uh, is uh, the end of XP. Like April 8th, which is like, oh, uh, yeah. what, uh, Tuesday? Uh, yeah, Tuesday. And uh, Best Buy and a bunch of other retailers doing like crazy deals on Chromebooks. You can get a Chromebook. XP switchers right now can get a Chromebook at Best Buy for like 99 bucks. So if you've got like an old XP machine laying around, you might want to take advantage right? of that deal. Uh, and they're not the only one. Uh, Barking and De- Dangenham councils, I don't know if I'm saying that right, probably not, are uh, swapping out XP machines for Chromebooks. And I, uh, the location to me is not so much as uh, interesting to me as just the, the how they're doing this and how right. I think this signals... A, a massive minimalization of Windows that's just going to continue over the next few years. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So 
This is, uh, they're based out of London, and uh, they're switching to Chromebooks to migrate XP machines because of the drop of support in April. The council is working with Google as an enterprise partner and Acronis, a reseller of Chromebooks and a reseller of Google services. As a joint venture, they have to, they're going to move, they're going to roll out 1,500 Chromebooks and 500 Chrome boxes, actual desktop machines. The council has estimated that by using the Chromebooks, it will save 200,000 euros on the cost of deploying new Windows desktops. It's estimated to further. It's estimated to have a further of 200,000 euros saving electricity with the more energy efficient Chrome OS devices. Uh, they now here's the key part that's making the secret sauce works. They're not totally moving away from Windows applications. Oh, they're not. And I think a lot of Linux users see this at first and they think, oh, well, this isn't really a win for Linux. But I disagree. I think when you minimalize Windows and you centralize Windows, it kind of does to Windows what they used to do with the old big. Unix mainframe boxes. Right, right. Uh, so here's what they've done. They've had a significant investment already in Citrix technologies. Uh, so they're going to use that to deliver a lot of the applications to the Chrome OS machines. Uh, so they found that this was a very robust solution. And the government agency responsible for IT security has developed security standards for councils using the Chrome operating system. I don't know exactly how you do that when it's a system designed to monitor yeah, you. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the laptops and employees will have Chromebooks and Chromeboxes. They'll be able to use them at reception desks and shared work areas. Using Citrix, Chromebooks will be the default device, but the council will use Windows 7 inside the Citrix environments. And they'll have some Windows 7 machines for specialized scanners and, and you know readers and things like that. So... A lot like my clients that have ran Linux before, they still end up having like a Windows box sitting at the end of some big plot printer or something like that. Wow. Some of the core systems, as such as the children and adult care systems, are browser-based, and Windows applications can be accessed with an HTML5 client. Mm -hmm. So that's how they'll do mm -hmm. it on Chrome OS. Very interesting. And I think that definitely minimalizing, because, you know, there's some places you still just need those legacy apps, and I get that. I say we want to move as quick as possible to a native browser-based applications when we can. We want to future-proof our systems based on how our employees will be working for five or ten years from now. I think that's wow. a huge statement right there. That's a gigantic statement, so, and one I don't think uh, Microsoft's been keeping up with. No, that's got to that's got to shake Microsoft when they hear that. Mm -hmm. I, I would think. I would hope so. So interesting, and uh, we'll watch how the thing how this kind of unfolds. And I think there's going to be a huge opportunity for Chromebooks. Could be. Uh, sort of a sort of a, a surprise announcement this week. Ubuntu One uh, is shutting down and shutting down like rapidly. Yeah. Uh, check this out. If you're an Ubuntu One user, as of June first, syncing will stop. On July 31st, all data will be wiped, and Ubuntu One will be no more. They've already pulled the packages from the 14.04 beta. Whoa. Moving fast here. Uh, so this was the mm. post from the uh, uh, Canonical CEO. She said, as of today, it will no longer be possible to purchase storage or music from the Ubuntu One store. Uh, the Ubuntu One file services will not be included in the upcoming 14.04 LTS release, and Ubuntu One apps in older versions of Ubuntu and in Ubuntu, Google, and Apple stores will be updated appropriately. I uh, probably pulled. The current services will be unavailable starting June 1st. Mm -hmm. User content will remain available for download until July 31st, at which time it will be deleted. Pretty, you know, I, pretty I, aggressive. Yeah, move. it's pretty aggressive. I'd like to say I was surprised, but uh, to be honest with you, the file stuff is basically Dropbox just does it already, so it was kind of a mood issue there. And as far as music streaming is concerned, you know, if you're using Android, you're probably using Google Play anyway, and if you're using an iPhone, you're not using Ubuntu. So, generally speaking, so uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think they yeah. realized what a pointless endeavor it really was. Yeah, um, I, I, I used it for a little while, and I was not impressed with it. I, so. I like that it tied into backup. I feel like yeah. Ubuntu One was never quite realized. I I wanted that would have been good, actually. Yeah, I wanted Ubuntu One to mean one Ubuntu, as in like I could have my configuration synced across my Ubuntu machines. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I see that what I always thought was that Ubuntu One would be on life support until this convergence situation is sort of realized. You and think, yeah. you know, in in Canonical's parlance, I've always pictured the story of Ubuntu <laughs> One being one that keeps all of my converged devices in sync. So like maybe I have a phone. And that phone doubles as my smartphone and my desktop. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I have a tablet. And that tablet maybe doubles as my reading tablet, my, my regular tablet device, mm -hmm. and maybe my TV smart center. You know, I dock it and it's connected to my TV. Right. Those are two separate devices, but I sure would like to have the configuration synced across all of them. And if I truly want convergence, to me, convergence isn't just hardware convergence. Convergence is also com with the cloud and synchronizing my settings and making sure that if I authenticate and log into the Ubuntu One service and things are stored securely and properly, I can configure things on one device and have them synchronized to another device. All of Google's uh, services, iCloud and things like that right. like they do for competing platforms. So now I wonder, is this mean that Canonical is going to scrap this? Because this I think, seems like I think a pretty they, key piece of the ecosystem. I, I think so. I think the problem that they're facing, though, is there's a perceived uh, cost issue when you're dealing with a larger, like, say, home directory. 
um, my home directory would cost me a fortune if I was using Ubuntu one. It would absolutely be just through the roof. So maybe the alternative is instead looking at BitTorrent Sync-like alternatives to where you still got that across-the-board synchronization, but at the same time, you're not trying to store it on a cloud, per se. You basically have your backups on other machines, and uh, yeah. you're, not paying, you're not paying that data rate. Well, that would add value to me as a user. I, hell, I would pay for it, honestly. And, you know, they, uh, uh, Canonical CEO said the free storage, just uh, the wars aren't sustainable place for us to be. There's recently just sense. been a drop in a lot of cloud storage services yeah. prices, particularly with other services now regular offering 25 to 50 gigabytes of free storage. Yeah. If we offer a service, we want to complete on a global scale, and for Ubuntu One to continue to do that, that would require more investment than we are willing to make. Yeah. And it just seems like, okay, so they're, you know, they're pretty clear that this is a product that wasn't working for us. I think they're very set on that LTS timescale. They want to make big changes before an LTS mm-hmm. hits. They don't want to be stuck supporting something and for I five years. And I agree with that. I agree with that. But I do think the one thing they need to look at is they need to start really realizing how can they make Ubuntu more compelling for the end user. And I think you know, being able to synchronize across the, across the I table. I think that's key when you're talking this yeah, convergence story. Right. I mean, it just, duh. It just seems like an obvious thing to me. And I hope they do. Maybe they will. Yeah. Okay. Well, so uh, um, I would say, too, if you want a recommendation for an alternative, BitTorrent Sync is one that I really like. I realize it's not open source. Mm. Uh, the other one that I, I really have been super happy with, and I think you use it, too, is Spider Oak. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm big happy. I'm really happy um, with that. I'm, I am getting more and more cold on Dropbox. I think it's pretty good software and pretty good technology, but did you just see that they had a DMC, DMCA takedown for a file that was in somebody's it, well, Dropbox? And they have an algorithm that actually goes through and yeah. says, oh, this has got ha- hashes this is hashed. All, yeah, yeah, this is hashed as such. Yeah. Um, because it's hashed as such, it's gone. They, and, and it's out of a public that, folder. They claim because it's hashed that they don't know what the file is, but if you had to generate that hash, yeah. then you had to generate it from a At source file. At one point, they knew. They yeah. may not know consciously 24-7, yeah. but they know. I, I, and I, and I, I realize so. that I realize and it is in the public folder. It was a shared link situation. Yeah. It's not a common thing, but I have gotten Principal. so pistol pistol whipped by YouTube and Content ID that I'm. I honestly, I start seeing anything that smells like Content ID on right. my file system that I pay for. I mean, I pay good money for Dropbox right. storage because I have a huge ass Dropbox, and the idea that anything like Content ID could show up in there is. It's offensive to me. It, and so I'm really lukewarm these days on Dropbox in a big way. I also don't like their security architecture. They have one shared key mm-hmm. to access everyone's files. We've talked about this extensively in TechSnap. It's how their deduplication system works. And I just don't like it from top to bottom, whereas Spider Oak, the encryption is done locally. Yes. It's, it's a trust no one type of architecture. That's right. Uh, and also, if you're just looking for straight up backup, uh, we talk about TarSnap mm-hmm. on TechSnap all the time. TarSnap, TarSnap is, awesome. is an awesome service. And uh, you can check it out too. You know, and as far as synchronizing across the board, I've been looking more and more into using BitTorrent Sync more and more. Yeah, the it's more great. I, use, isn't I it? mean, it's like for music, bam, done. I, I know USB. What's that? I don't. No, I, you, you know, yeah. that's why I distribute the Unfiltered Supporter Show over BitTorrent Sync right. because you get all you get you get all five episodes just listed right mm-hmm. in here. You tap the one you want, and BitTorrent Sync pulls it down crazy fast. Right. I I can't believe how fast it pulls it down, and it's like a virtual CDN in the in the sky, exactly. and it's a great way to just get pictures. There's also yeah. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a BitTorrent Sync picture option where you can sync all the pictures oh, from yeah. your device over BitTorrent sync back to your rig. Yeah, I've done that. And then that. I just have Shotwell looking at that directory, exactly. and I also have Darktable looking at that directory. I can have all my. I even have uh, the. Uh, uh, I'm for drop blanking on the name, but the KD photo app that I don't use very much. Exactly. <laughs> right. K Snap or whatever. No, yeah. I can't remember uh, what it is, but I have uh, all Digicam of them. Digicam or something? Or? Yeah, yeah, Digicam. Digicam yeah. I have all of them looking at this one directory, and I don't even have to worry about getting the files in there because I just know that BitTorrent sync's taking exactly. care of that. And the fact that, like in the Android app, you have the option saying, hey, I don't want this happening over mobile data. I want it only happening over Wi Fi. It can handle yep. that. And so I walk yep. in the door, and it's like, boop, there it is. It just starts doing it. Exactly. You just start showing up on your machine. You don't even have to think about it. I love that. I love that. And you know, and I feel like it's you know, it's reasonably secure. I feel good about that. And the fact that uh, it actually is allowing me to do stuff that I couldn't do well with, say, like Google Play. Google Play is not for me. Yeah, um, I'm not. I don't like the player. I don't like. I don't like anything about it. So yeah, this was huge. a good option for me. Yeah, yeah. And you got you got your own music collection. Mm-hmm. You got it. So uh, there's a bit of there was a bit of a uh, dust up over the week uh, between Linus and uh, Kay Sievers, one of the System D authors, yes. and uh, it went public after an outrage. Um, has Mucketware here put it? The Linux kernel developers uh, were locking horns this week over a bug in System D, which would stop <laughs> systems from booting up. Uh, the yeah. bug was filed by Borsov Pektov. Uh, where he explained that SystemD mm-hmm. bug was not allowing him to log into the machine. Kay Sievers, the co-author of SystemD, suggested kernel developers not use generic terms like debug. Like for the kernel, he said, there are options for fine-grained control SystemD's logging behavior. Just don't use the generic term debug, which is a convenience shortcut for the kernel and for the base OS. Mm-hmm. That sort of set Linus off. Linus wrote back, Key, I'm effing tired of the fact that you don't fix problems in your code that you write. 
and that the colonel has to do work to work around problems you cause. He goes on to rip into him for a little bit. <laughs> they have a back and forth. Uh, Lenart Pottering goes to Google+, Plus, says his piece. Uh, Lenart uh, was very gracious, says, you know, we're going to make the fix. Uh, but for me, it's out of the question that the system and the other COS components should continue to parse the debug kernel command line option. He goes on to say, we are putting together an OS here, after all, not just a kernel. And the kernel is just one component of the OS among many, and ultimately an implementation detail. True. Uh, and then Linus goes back, and, you know, they, 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 they had a back and forth over it. But I thought... Uh, the chapter's making fun of my pronunciations <laughs> right now. Uh, so I thought this was this was interesting because it shows a little bit of friction between the system D developers and the kernel guys. And I think you know Lenart tried to smooth everything over. Uh, and what I found to be interesting about it is Linus was essentially asserting, you know, you keep making these bugs and then you expect us to fix them, which seems fair. I mean, no one wants to basically tow along the other guy. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I get that. Uh, and I just creatively it, worded, but. Yeah, uh, I, I'm reading through it right now, and I just find it pretty interesting the way they go back and forth. Linus says, uh, so what exactly was the problem with using systemd.debug again? He says, I guess this does mean that we have to apply my patch to, re to rate limit these messages into the kernel. Fine. I don't hate that patch, but I do hate the fact that systemd seems to think we're being assholes, and it's not our problem. Other users should protect themselves against our effed up ways. I like that Linus is now so, uh, censoring himself a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I, I feel like it's family friendly now. Uh, so oh, yeah. Alina seemed to got pretty upset. All the things I think are progressing forward. It's not the end of the world. Mm. Uh, but that does bring us to uh, Linus's Q&A that he held at the Portland Linux Users Group this last Thursday. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get a chance to uh, restream it on our JB Live uh, stream. We had a few hundred people show up and watch that live with us. And uh, it was a great, great Q&A. I will have the entire Q&A. They released it as an MP3, and I think they're working on video, too. Uh, we'll have that linked in the show notes. But I grabbed a few highlights from our stream. We're just going to play a couple of them. And uh, the whole talk was about almost two hours long. We'll right. probably have, like, two minutes of talk, uh, maybe, or so of clips. But uh, so... I picked out a few of my favorite ones. Since we just had Linus on a flame war, I thought we'd play this, <laughs> this first question. They asked you know, a little bit about his approach and about yeah. flame wars, and uh, Linus had this to say. Go. Cool. Person. <laughs> and uh, my, uh, my, yeah, not argument, because it's not an argument, it's trying to be a defense, is that it takes all kinds. Oh, yeah. and, and I will say that you probably have to be ornery and kind of monomaniacal to do something for 23 years. Right? So that's my excuse. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a pat on the back kind of person. I, when people do things that I think are stupid, I will let them know. And I actually enjoy it too. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I, I, I really like the nice people, but I really like a good flame festival. <laughs> Sometimes I feel bad about it afterwards, but God, it's cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's awesome. Uh, that uh, the audio's got there's a little fan noise in there, but this was yeah. this was just kind of an unofficial Q and A that uh, Linus was kind enough to show up and and chat and um, mm -hmm. you know he, he lives in the area and uh, they were uh, they had a machine there recording it and uh, streaming it. So uh, he then was asked a few other questions. Uh, how about uh, what do you think about VMs, Linus, and do you use VMs? So the question was, do I use virtual machines and how does it compare to a real machine? Um, I love people who use virtual machines. Personally, I don't, because all the actually interesting problems in kernels tend to be about the hardware and the driver space. Uh, I don't, if you're a file system developer, by all means, I mean, if you are not using a virtual machine, you're probably doing something stupid. I mean, let's face it, you need to be using a virtual machine. You need to have a virtual disk image that you can easily trash and you can do things on. For a file system developer, you're not really working with real hardware anyway. You're really driving at a completely different layer. Um, me, personally, when I started, and still, I'm more interested in the real hardware aspect. That said, it's not what I do anymore. These days, what I do is I pull things from other people, and I am a manager, even though I try very hard not to act very managerial. <laughs> very successfully. <laughs> 
Yeah. That was a great clip. I like that. Uh, uh, so uh, he uh, goes on to uh, answer a question about uh, gaming and how important. Actually, why don't we start with yeah. this? Is my we'll start. Uh, let's start with Android because the gaming and the desktop questions mm -hmm. were some of my favorite questions he was asked. Uh, so uh, let's. I have two kind of not related to desktop, and we'll, okay. so we'll play. We'll save those for last. The next one was I thought it was just kind of interesting. Linus was asked about Git. And even if you look at, like, Git has been hugely successful, but every time I mention Git, I do want to point out that I actually was the project lead only for four to five months, right? I came up with a basic architecture. I got it limping off along enough that you could use it if you really understood how it worked, right? But it was famous for being hard to use. And all the credit for Git should go to Junio Hamano, who, I mean, took it from the rough early steps to where it is now. There you go. So he was very gracious and not, you know, he's not That's trying really to take cool. a ton of credit yeah. for it. And then he was asked uh, if, if he has a problem with the fact that so many people are using Linux and they don't even know it in Android and how he feels about that as the creator oh, of Linux. Oh, my goodness. I, the, the, the kernel of an operating system should be something that a user shouldn't care about. And both Google and Ubuntu have actually been very good about making the users not care about the kernel. Right? You notice both of those very much do not sell their system as Linux. Right, And I think that's, I, I mean, some people complain about that. And I understand you're a kernel developer and you feel slighted by, I don't know why kernel developers love to hate Ubuntu, but a lot of them do. Right? <laughs> and, and they feel slighted by the fact that Ubuntu does not, are canonical, does not call Ubuntu Linux. They, and they don't even show it anywhere. And I actually think that's healthy, because why should you call it Linux, right? The kernel is really interesting. It's the most interesting piece of technology you can do if you're a software developer. But if you're a user, you really, really, really shouldn't care. So that's why I'm saying, yes, Android is Linux, but it's OK that nobody knows, right? I thought that was a that's, very balanced mm -hmm. answer. Like, he's, he has a very answer. level head there. Uh, so then they asked him what he, how he feels about gaming and if it's important for Linux. Gaming. So have you talked to Valve about that? Do you have any thoughts on gaming on Linux? I, really, I, I actually think gaming is hugely important because it has been one of the areas that, that you can't really do over the internet. There, sure, I mean, you can get in a web browser. And there's, you can't do it. But at the same time, certain levels of games, you need to have very low hardware access. Uh, gaming is something that I personally don't find that interesting. I don't game. I, I've never found a game that can really hold my interest. So I don't get involved, but I actually think Valve getting involved on Linux is really, really important. I mean, and let's see how it works out because these things always take much longer than you really expect them to take. But at the same time, uh, it's certainly a huge like deal. The fact that they just think, hey, we may be able to do this Linux game box and sell it, and, and we have the distribution channel, and, and uh, we actually want to control the whole stack because we are tired of having other people in our way when we want to do something. So I, I think actually, and this is how a lot of companies get involved in, in open source in general. And I, I think it's hugely important that Valve does that and, and maybe pushes other things, people there too. I agree with uh, TRCG in the chat room. Linus needs to try Race the Sun because I think he might, uh, he might find that's a really fun game. I think, yeah, I agree. So this was, I saved the best for last. This was my favorite question of the night. Or actually, I should say my favorite answer. Uh, so Linus was asked uh, if he felt uh, what the status of Linux on the desktop was and, 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 what it, and what he thinks its importance is. And you can tell kind of by his body language. I don't know if he loves getting this question anymore. But Probably not. I he loved, gets it all the time. I loved the answer, though. So the question was the desktop issue. Which year? Right? Uh, I have a 
a really hard time answering that question just because for me, the main target still is the desktop and always has been. It's how I use it. I don't, I mean, okay, I, I use it Linux on my cell phone and I know it's on, on the cell phone and I love the fact that, but I don't care at the same time. I don't develop for my cell phone. Right. Uh, so for me, Linux has always been about the desktop. Uh, it has been improving hugely. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> I mean, I noticed. Thanks. I, um, I think it's. I'm trying to speak loudly enough to be heard. Maybe I'm overdoing it, or maybe I'm just not used to it. <coughs> so it has been improving, and, and a large portion of that has been that a lot of the traditional desktop applications have just become much less important. I mean, again, mm -hmm. when I think back about the whole question, question about desktop and Linux mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I was still back then trying to push Linux on the desktop. But realistically, it was just not a valid proposition for most people. That has changed. It's still not a, I mean, it's still a uh, uphill battle. And I understand that it doesn't happen. But at the same time, I did my taxes on Linux this year. And I didn't do it because Intuit is wonderful. They are horrible people yeah. who <laughs> basically pay the government to make it a market that they like to be in. Yeah. But they, despite the fact that I hate having to admit it, Intuit on Linux works really, really well because you just do it in a browser. right? And that's actually getting really common. I, I thought that was a great answer. And yes. we just talked about the Chromebooks earlier in the show, and I think it speaks to that. So yes. uh, the entire talk is posted up over at the Portland Linux Users Group. We have a direct link to the MP3 file in our show notes. And be sure you check out their page, because uh, I think they'll be posting a video version. And we'll probably have it on the subreddit, too. That's probably where you'll yeah, catch I it, agree. too, is in our subreddit. But thanks very much to uh, the Portland Linux Unix, yeah, and Unix Group for uh, letting us restream that. That's awesome. Great Q&A, and there's lots more in there, too. Lots yeah. of other goodies that I just didn't pull, because... Uh, you can just watch the whole talk. Cool. All right, Matt. That's all the news for this week. It's time to talk about Sabi and Linux, a rolling distribution that mixes a little source with its binary packages. We're going to check back up on this guy and see how it's done over the years. But mm -hmm. first, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76, creators of machines born to run Linux. Now, Yeesh. this is not an exaggeration in the slightest. Oh, okay. Every single day, <laughs> I configure an Ultra Pro, and I think about... I uh, know. That, that configuration tool is it just is torture. Well, and like, I'll tell you why I'm doing it too so much now is because I'm driving back sometimes yeah. twice a day to, you know, back yeah. and forth between here and the studio, and I'm just, I just keep having all of these reasons, and I'm thinking, you know, new Ubuntu release, loaded on this guy, that right? really, right. really, really sweet. Uh, and of course, so that's the Ultra Pro. I think it's one of the best machines that System76 has ever had. They yeah. also have a bunch of uh, fantastic desktops. We've had uh, the uh, Leopard Extreme in-house punished that. You should watch oh, that yeah. review if you haven't seen it. Good Wild review. Dog Performance is a performer that we still have in studio mm -hmm. that we use from time to time. And the Rattel Performance is like, I think this is one of the sleeper System76 rigs. I think so. Not only does it have a great price, but you can actually configure it with a pretty good discrete video card. Mm -hmm. You can get a nice core uh, i7, fourth generation, 16 gigabytes of RAM. I mean, this is a great rig. Make a really slick media box, I think. And they build them right here in the U.S., too, Yeesh. which is really awesome. So go over to System76. Stop fighting with your hardware. Stop fighting with your Wi-Fi. Stop fighting with your blue, your blue, uh, Bluetooth, the fingerprint reader, whatever it is. Stop it. And just play with your Linux. Go get a nice. System76 machine, and, and you'll have a fantastic experience out of the box. And you also know it's going to work great with future Linux releases as well, because they make sure to future-proof mm -hmm. these things. My wife's been eyeballing one of those Sable completes. Yeah, yeah it's time. perfect. I, I think it'd be really good for the studio. I tell you, I, I would already have pulled the trigger on the Ultra Pro if it wasn't for the fact that the Bonobo is no slouch. Like This is true, yeah. It's like, I still feel like um, I still have breathing room on the Bonobo for all the performance that I need, and I... I'm not really under a lot of pressure to get a different machine, but I tell you what, I just covet it. <laughs> you still like to kind of configure it every once in a while? Every day. Yeah. I, every day. Every day. Go to System76.com and check out some of their machines, yeah. and a big thank you to System76 for sponsoring Linux Action Show. Ooh. And yeah, that's my IP you guys see in your configurator. <laughs> every day, I try it out. Different hard drive configurations. <laughs> I keep up in the drive the size. are just like, man, he really comes here a lot. Well, and as I fill up my drive on this Bonobo every single day these days, I'm like, well... Maybe I want a bigger hard drive. Yeah. I, I put to 740. <laughs> 
Uh, so let's talk about Sabian Linux. We've yes. talked about it in the past, and uh, I'd say for the most part, our previous distribution stands. And so what I wanted to do is instead of redo that review, um, which was from 2012, I thought I wanted to kind of touch on some of the stuff that I felt like is the Delta since that review. Okay. If you're not familiar with Sabian Linux, it's a Gen 2 based Linux distribution. They follow an out of the box philosophy where they aim to give the user a wide number of applications ready to use, configured like your 3D acceleration, works out of the box, uh, Steam is pre installed. XBMC was. That blew my yeah, mind. I yeah. was just like, wait, what? Uh, uh, they call it the uh, everything out of the box philosophy. Yeah. I call it the kitchen sink philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, Sabian Linux features a rolling release cycle. Ding, 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 ding. That's something we've been really hot on over the last year. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always checking out uh, rolling release distros. We just talked about Solid XK recently, right. a Debian based rolling release. Uh, so it also has its own software repository and package management system called Entropy. And Sabian's available for both x86, AMD64, and ARM 7s. There's one in development for the BeagleBone specifically. Wow. Yeah, and it's definitely, like, it's loaded with some great games like Nexu is and a few other really mm -hmm. good things. So out of the box, this thing comes totally, totally stocked. Here's the thing. Okay. I got to start with the bad. Okay, yeah, go ahead and reel that in. Uh, the installer is, um, it pretty much hasn't changed since I looked at it in 2012. Yeah. It's it's an old version of Anaconda. Yeah. Uh, it's... It is horrendously it, slow. It could be better. It definitely could be better. Um, I, 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 have, I have installed this distribution mm. more than a dozen times in the last two days, and it is painfully slow for this distribution to install. This is the slowest distribution install I have ever seen. And on top of that, on the Intel NUC, which either in legacy BIOS mode or UEFI mode, my system was left unbootable. Well, the problem was, is I wanted specifically to set up an XBMC installation of Sabian, sense. because they have an option during installation, would you like a GNOME KDE installation, yeah. would you like a Steam, they have a Steam big picture mode out of the box, it takes you right into Steam big picture mode, would you like an XBMC installation, we'll take you to XBMC right out of the box, you get a nice current version of XBMC, because mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's all updated. Right. The problem is, is at the installation screen. If you choose, say, the XBMC installation, or say the Steam Big Picture mode, or hacker mode, where they give you like an open box desktop, sure. everything else under the sun is still installed. Oh, everything. See, that, see, that's stupid. I mean, like, I get, I, no, see, that doesn't make sense. Come on, guys. Come and the on. problem is, on a rolling release, the more things you have installed, the wider the surface area is yeah. for mistakes to happen. And so when I have an XBMC machine, I don't necessarily yeah. want Chromium installed, Wine installed. Yeah, because I just went with the GNOME install. I didn't actually try the other installations. Oh, that's interesting. Right, and so to me, it's, it felt like, a, if I was going to use this, right. and I could see myself using this for sure. Steam Big Picture mode and for oh, XBMC, yeah. BMC mode, to me, it seems like those should be super whittled down, just focused on the core requirements to make that environment work. That way, the rolling release doesn't really cock anything up when you have a big update. But even once I had it installed, I did an update, and that update was so large that it filled the drive I was running on for all of the packages that were installed for that XBMC installation. That was also my complaint, is running updates was, while it was, I, I, liked, I liked the updater, I thought it was cool. I, you know, it's just like, oh my God, seriously. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah, and so it's, it's like, like yeah. here's how I would here's how I would classify it is, Sabian is for those of you who are aware of a lot of advanced options, like the, why you might want to build from source. Maybe like yeah. you enjoy like the optimizations, or people never Fast. package that binary in a way that, with that flag you mm -hmm. need, and so you want source. But at the same time, like you don't need source for everything, so you want your binary packages too. Yeah. So you're a more advanced user, and Sabian recognizes that. In fact, they drop all pretenses of being some big corporate distro. Like their dialogues are like plain English. Mm -hmm. They're great. They make you smile. They don't have uh, a story. <laughs> right, yeah. They don't have a vision in a story. Well, they have a vision, but it's, they don't have right. this like this concocted story and this right, overall exactly. myth around the distribution for convergence or any of that crap. Uh, and you know, like even in their installer, they like they they take a pop at Debian. Yeah, you know, they they have fun <laughs> with the fact that oh, we have Zonotic. Nobody has that. You know, they it's <laughs> right. It's yep, very yep. like I I like I feel like I I am a little connected to the developers and mm -hmm. and and I'm also connected to a community when I'm installing this distribution. So I give them points there. Uh, so I, I think it can appeal to a certain type of Linux user. Sure. The problem I have is too much of it. I, I think I think when you're a boutique distribution, when you're a small shop distribution, I think you really all you have to nail it with focus. You have ah. to if you don't have a large team of you know hundreds of people, and if you don't have a user base of thousands and th of tens of thousands, mm -hmm. you really have got to 
pick your and choose your battles because you have limited resources. And I think it's not a great one to one comparison, but just recently, the elementary uh, OS guys, one of the developers, put out a video. And I think one of the things that you can really say about elementary OS is they show an extreme amount of focus. Yes, and uh, this video, I'm just going to play a couple seconds of it. It's It shows you the exact opposite a, a, a end of the spectrum that Sabian's on. Okay. So he, boots up, Pro. he boots up his MacBook Pro. <laughs> uh, All right, we got this awesome no grub anywhere dual bootloader. Going to load up the best OS, ISIS. Zero grub anywhere on my system. It's all EFI. It's so this is the new ISIS release, and he's going to go through and demo some of these features here. Black bar, so oh. wing panel automatically adds it in because it's necessary. Okay. And then there's this one. It'll actually adjust the opacity of the bar depending on oh, wow. uh, what the exact kind of thing it is. I mean, just all of them, it does the right thing. It's just amazing. The other thing you'll notice is that switchboard is like amazingly better now. Um, it looks better. There's way better icons. Uh, you can toggle right... There's like an amazing like fluid motion movement. <laughs> so he goes on like here I'll, I'll jump for it. I'll show like yeah. we'll show something else. My what I want to illustrate here is what these developers are demonstrating is the benefit of focus because not only do you get a good feature set, but you also have something for everyone to sort of rally around to focus on. You have a, a very clear uh, message for the end user. Super super cool. Uh, it's really fluid. Everything works amazingly. Um, yeah, things are just yeah. Use the sword. Yeah, humming along. Okay. Um, what else? Maya uh, is almost ready for like really good usage. It's and where I and the comparison I want to draw here is I feel like Sabian is yeah. it's sort of because it's everything you're all in. Like when you install the Hacker Edition, you right click on the desktop in Open Box, you sure. get you get like the links option in the menu. But in reality, Chromium's installed, they're just hiding it from the menu. So it's sort of like glossing over the fact that all of these packages are installed by just showing you one particular interface. But you bring so, up and, a terminal, a you big, launch Chromium. simple fix. I, I don't understand why they didn't do that, because I like the fact that they have that option at the beginning where you can, like, XBMC or, you know, Steam, or Steam Big Picture or whatever. I like that, but why the hell wouldn't you say, hmm, probably don't need all this extra crap in there? Yeah. Um, you know, so if they fix that, I was like, well, gee, that'd be great. But also, the, the download process feels a bit dated. Um, yeah. I, I couldn't I couldn't get the GNOME ISO from two of their U.S. mirrors. Oh, yeah. You know, you have, so you have to go, you have to go, you, you had to scroll right. through a big list of mirrors, sort of, again, not not necessarily bad, not bad for the torrent well, user, but torrent, old school. And their torrent was like, yeah. 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 Boop, boop, boop. yeah. Up down, <laughs> up like, down. Oh my god. Uh, and that, and I wonder if because maybe their their US servers web seeds were down because I, yeah. I couldn't download the ISO from any of the US servers. I actually had to pull it from I think an Italian server. I even tried um just because I thought, okay, you know, hey, it's not you, it's me. Um uh, you know, Frontiers being a butt. So I was like, all right, that's cool. I'll VPN to try it, you know, which made a little bit of difference, but not a lot. Yeah. Um Yeah, the torrent was pretty yeah. rocky rocky yeah. for me too. I ended up pulling it down from an FTP server. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what I go back to is what we talked about in the previous review is they have a really awesome package manager in the sense that it yeah. exposes a lot of good details. It gives you the versions of software straight up. It gives you uh, well, the last time that package is updated in the particular repo. So there's a lot of nice features there. The update system's pretty good. At the end of the day, in 2012 when I reviewed this, I felt like this was potentially worthy of a dedicated SSD drive. Right. I, I was going to keep an installation of it. I eventually moved away because... I feel like, in some sense, Sabian has lost its competitive edge. It still has a, a, a good proposition to a, a large niche of the Linux audience. Sure. sure. In you know that source binary mix there and that rolling release, which is a huge benefit for us. But at the same time, I, I kind of feel like it's 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 leapfrogged some of the other distros in some sense. Like the fact right. that it offers Steam Big Picture mode out of the box, the fact that you can do XBMC out of the box, and it's a super recent version of XBMC. That all feels like a usability improvement over some of the competition out there. But at the same time, areas like the installer and areas like just loading so many packages, I think one of the few lessons we have learned from even the most earliest releases of Ubuntu is refining your selection and focusing on the best applications for that desktop setup really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a big success piece was for Ubuntu early on. And I think some of the things that I didn't take issue with in 2012, now in 2014 feel like they're not quite as excusable anymore. And so, no. while I enjoyed the distro, and while it feels very fast, the performance was good, 
I had so many problems getting it installed. I couldn't install it on my NUC. I had issues getting it installed in a VM because it yeah. filled up a drive space. I had so many barriers to actually getting down and enjoying the distribution that I found myself very frustrated with the entire experience. Well, for me, I actually, surprisingly, felt uh, had it reasonably, although be it slow as molasses, um, no problem getting it installed. I, I pretty much had to take a nap waiting for it. But um, once it was finally installed, it was fine. My biggest complaint was the fact that, as you pointed out with the whole package just being included, like in just like in GNOME mode, for instance, mm -hmm. I don't really need XBMC installed. Yeah, right. You know, it's, it's a little odd. Yeah, so it's kind of like I, I think if they, I, okay, even if you don't have the resources to focus on improving your installer, I'll, I'll forgive that. Be it, you know, I get it. You got limited resources. Yeah, but yeah. For the love of Pete, focus on the packages that are including with each option. If you could do that, that thing alone would make me give serious thought to actually right. spending more time with and, this. And really I would. I honestly think that's a little more key to a, to a sustainable rolling release yeah. than, than it, people are giving it credit, because the less you have to update, the less that's going to break. Sure. Now, uh, very fairly pointed out, uh, Mega Man X 19 in our chat room says, hey, you know what? I like a fully loaded distribution, 1978. He says, it, for me, that's, that's the way I prefer my Linux. And you know what? I totally get that, and I understand that this is for some folks. It's kind of nice to just have everything. Like, well, and that potentially could be their niche. I mean, that maybe they, yeah. that's what they are addressing. I, you know, that I'm not getting. That's fair. Back okay. in the day, I was the guy that got the Open SUSE box DVD set and installed <laughs> every single right? thing, right? Because I wanted everything. So there was a point in life in life when I wanted that, but mm -hmm. I feel like that's maybe more appropriate for snapshotted releases. I'm not sure. I would say this. Yeah. If you're, if you know, the whole reason why we tried it is because a lot of you responded very positively to our Gen 2 coverage, and a lot of you are are enjoying the concept of a mm -hmm. rolling release. And so I thought, okay, let's combine the, those two things and see what we have with Sabian. I think at the end of the day, you could deploy Sabian on your machine. You'd feel like you have an awesome feature set. You'd feel like you have one of the most powerful distributions under the hood. But there's probably some spring cleaning you're going to want to do, some cleanup, some removal of some unessential packages, mm -hmm. and and just sort of some general tidying. And I'll tell you, you know, uh, for example, during the live environment, I, I was having some problems. Like We could never get it installed on the Intel NUC, which would have made the perfect XBMC rig. So mm -hmm. one of the things I decided to do is I would try to update the live environment. Okay. Well, it ended up needing 926 yeah. packages to update the live environment. Six, There were 607 packages that needed updated, but then once you factored in all of the dependencies, it was 920, which filled up the live environment and killed the installer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tried that experiment, too. That didn't last real long. So I think for me, it comes down to this. I'm impressed enough with it that if I was to choose between, say, this and Manjaro, for example, I probably would choose this. Yeah. Honestly. Um, that being said, if if Arch was, you know, to disappear or Integros was to disappear tomorrow, um, I would probably consider yeah. spending some time on this. Yeah, honestly. and I would I would just take the time yeah. to sort of get I'd it where it I need up. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I would actually find so despite my criticisms of it. Yeah, I'm not giving up on this yet. I yeah. think I'm going to be playing with this for I, a while. I think where it has difficulty is this is now a world where Integros Integros is a distribution Integros. and it's doing well. Yeah, and Arch is much bigger than it was in 2012 oh, and continues to grow. And so the the competitive landscape that mm. Sabian is now up against is not the same anymore. Right. And at this point, it, I, I have, maybe because I'm getting old and busy, <laughs> I prefer to start minimal and then build on top yeah. of what I need. I like that from a security standpoint. I like that from a stability standpoint. Mm -hmm. I like that from a drive space usage standpoint. And for me, that's why Sabian isn't a great fit. However, if you got a big arse drive and you want to just load it up with some of the best packages in, in Linux, go for Sabian's it. Sabian's going to do it right out of sure. the box for you. Sure. So uh, we'll have links to some of the Sabian info, including screenshots of the installer. And go check our 2012 review uh, of Sabian, because really, we had a lot of good things to say in that review, including we, we focused more on the package management system mm -hmm. and things like that. So I, I almost would say that's required uh, watching. I, I think it's a good pre uh, pre uh, prerequisite, for yeah. sure. But at yeah. the same time, the one thing I would implore the developers to do, and I, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, XBMC and Steam Big Picture, when you're choosing an installation, Drop the other packages. Yeah. There's no reason for yeah. it. Yeah, like when you do Steam Big Picture yeah. mode, you get a full GNOME 3 right. desktop. That's stupid. Now, in fairness, in GNOME, okay, you want to leave XBMC and, and Steam and stuff. Okay, you know, that's cool. That's fine. I get it. 
Yeah. People want that. That's yeah. cool. But there's zero reason in XBMC and Steam Big Picture mode to have that. It just there isn't. It's too much. It doesn't make any sense. And, I, and it, it, it takes something that would have been a practical, like well, nice yeah. way to have a I, very current version, yeah. almost apply a limited version size of SSD, and you yeah. just loaded it up with yeah. stuff you don't want. Yeah. So yeah, I, like my NUC has a 120 gigabyte right. uh, little uh, PCI Express SSD. Exactly. Because if you like, wanted the other thing, you would have chose GNOME or KDE yeah. or something. Like so, if I was going to do an Arch installation well, and do a minimal X installation and then install XBMC, right. Bob's your uncle. I'm taking like four gigabytes total exactly and this thing was filling up the drive but despite that yes i'm going to still be spending some time with it because i really like the package manager that yeah was fun and it was if, a lot of fun uh you know they're all in on steam which is yeah. super cool to yeah. see them uh, deploy cool. steam big picture mode like when you install it so you get steam big picture mode you get mm -hmm. that installed you accept the user agreement for steam then it downloads the latest version of the steam packages and then boom you're right in there you log into your steam account yeah it ran really well actually. yeah it works and it's it's really cool it's just like Matt said. It's just some of the packages. Yeah, They're just too much. That's all. But yeah. outside of that gripe, yeah, hey, it's cool. I definitely think we both say, give it a try. Oh, hell yes. See if it oh, works definitely install it. Don't just run yeah. the live thing and think you got it. No, you really got to install it and actually experience the package. And you know, like we forget, back in 2012, too, it was really nice, and it still is today, yeah. to have 3D drivers work oh, out God. of the box. Yeah. So that is no a, that's kidding. something you can't discount either. It's just not the hurdle it used to be, so it does And on a rolling release, that. Because you could yeah. still get it back then, yeah. but it was usually in some podunky. Yeah, it wasn't probably rolling. Yeah, Ew. great point. All right, Matt, that's the Linux Action Show's look mm -hmm. at Savian. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But, Matt, before we get out of here, why don't you think, you know, I don't know. Should we read some emails? What do you think? Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. right. Ish. Our first one comes in from Corbin. He says, I just wanted to follow up uh, from a previous email I'd sent in. You guys were talking about GNOME videos in the new GNOME 3.12. And how great it would be to have a Jupyter Broadcasting channel in there. Well, I now have made a Python script, which adds the options of any of Jupyter Broadcasting shows, and I have attached the projects. We will have a link in there. If anybody has GNOME 3.12 and wants to try adding Jupyter Broadcasting Eesh. to the new GNOME Videos application, you might remember we talked about that. Right now, out of the box, it's got like The Guardian and Blip.tv Weird. and Happy Movie Trailers, and mm. I thought it'd be cool to have. It would be very be cool. So yeah, he, logical, too. He made a little Python script that'll do it for you, nice. and we have a link, uh, a direct download link in the show notes. Good stuff. Michael writes in and he says, hey, can you please do a piece on the Gooseberry Project? It's, just, it's an open source feature film, something that's never been attempted that would bring many benefits, and he links us to a few of the things. He says, please help this project become a reality. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, the program they're using is Maya. It has native Linux binaries along with Hundi, uh, Cinema 4D, and Soft Image. There's a lot of open source in the animation industry. It links us to Disney, Sony, Imageworks, and Pixar. He's an animator programmer himself. Nice. I don't know if you've... Have you seen this, Matt? This is the Gooseberry Project. They're trying to get no, some funding. And the idea is to make a full feature-length animated film using open source software top to bottom. Wow. Bringing in legitimate, like, you know, industry professionals and artists. And uh, why don't we play a little yeah. bit of the trailer? Because it's pretty cool. Sounds nice. Here we go. Hi. My... My my name is Michelle. And I am a... Everything is confused. I, I was. Well, I, I might be. I'm a, I'm a sheep! And no, I want to go home. So all these different styles, all these different artists. I mean, this this, this looks like a this looks like this a Hollywood really style. Cool. This could put open source uh, editing software like this on the map. Oh, it really would. Yeah. Absolutely. And so they're trying to get people involved. Go to gooseberry.blender.org if you'd like to contribute and you know help some of these open source professional level tools become a reality. And also, you know, it's a movie. So not only are you backing a movie. All uh, Veronica Mars kind of style, uh, right. but uh, you're also helping the realization of these tools be used for a feature length film. And uh, they're, I think they're going to have about a five million dollar budget if everything gets funded. That's they, about what you want. Yeah, they got it all three, you know, three point five to six million euros is what they said. Boy. Yeah, and uh, I think it's kind of amazing. How's their funding going so far? They have a. Uh, they have. Uh, they've got some. They've so they're trying to get to 640 USD. They've oh, they raised got 202. 202. And yeah. How much uh, time they got left? 13, 13 days. days. Uh, a little tight. They're gonna. They're gonna have to come up with a big ramp up here. Uh, as somebody who produces a lot of content, I sure would love to see something that like this be, be awesome. successful. So we'll have a link to this. Uh, you can also find it at cloud.bender.org/gooseberry. Mm -hmm. If uh, you want to go there directly, that's cloud.bender.org/gooseberry. Now you might remember uh, their their previous film they did. This is this. Will 
will be a full feature length film. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah. So, and uh, thanks to, uh, uh, was it uh, Michael who sent yeah. that in? Previous really one was awesome. like a what, a bunny rabbit, I think? Yep. 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 All right, Matt, what are you up to throughout the week? Where should we send folks? Uh, as always, you can find me at datamation.com. Scroll down to open source. I got stuff there. I think my latest article is my top Linux frustrations of 2014, basically echoing the last 10 years. So uh, uh, let me know. ask you something. Did you get a gaming mouse and have a hard time setting it up so you made a rant piece? No, it's actually, it's actually, <laughs> no, a buddy of mine actually did. And so uh, it was like, you know, because I was yeah. like, well, I'll get it working. I'll help like, you. It's like, yeah. oh, it's like, oh, God, I still got to do this the old stupid way. It's like, yeah, this is that is frustrating, isn't it's it? It's just like, come on. Sometimes you know? it gets stupid fast. Because I've seen. I've seen applications in the past that were like uh, brand specific. I think Logitech was one of them. Yeah. That came out with a little yep. app, app yep. that you could configure some stuff with, but yep. it's still not quite there yet. And the existing tools are not really where they need to be. So anyway, so there's that article. Yep. And uh, also, my nephew and I are actually working on a project right now, and uh, basically, it's to uh, get him doing stuff. This and is we're really cool. I like your intro yeah, like here. Intro? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, we got the retro intro, and we also have one for uh, Steam games. And you well. got the uh, artwork from Albert in there. That's yes, awesome. Yeah, we totally nailed that out. Oh, Donkey Kong! Yeah, we're doing some uh, oh, some classic it. gaming here. I think a Super NES on this one. And then we're also doing some Steam games. So it's a Geek and the Gamer. Geek and the Gamer. YouTube, so all one word. Geek and the Gamer on YouTube. YouTube.com slash Geek and the Gamer. So you got, and, uh, you, know. you got some Steam games. You got some retro games. Yeah, we've been playing that uh, Electronic Super Joy. And, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, man, Donkey Kong. Oh, yeah. man, and that see, brings uh, back Basically, memory. I'm the geek because I can't game to save my life. <laughs> and he, of course, eats and breathes and lives the stuff and is really well-versed on classic games. Yeah. So it works out well. YouTube.com slash Geek and the Yeesh. Gamer for, uh, you know, Let's Plays are blowing up, too, so it's a good yes, time to do them. I want to do some let's plays. Yeah, I think it'd be, it's going to be kind of fun to see where it goes. You know, I I'll, I do yes play I, let's plays. I kind of do let's plays on uh, yeah. the pre stream on uh, uh, yeah, if you join right? us live on Sunday. Uh, the show officially kicks off around 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, mm -hmm. 6 p.m. UTC. But if you show up anywhere between an hour and a half hour beforehand, I'm usually on the live stream. Recently playing Race the Sun. There's a little pre show. Kind of a wake up. Yeah. There, in fact, if you have watched the Linux Action Show or listened to the Linux Action Show for a long time. Uh, and you haven't tuned in live, maybe just you make an opportunity to, to do it because it's a lot more show. It's That's right. Like hours of more show. Oh, actually. there's crazy <laughs> shenanigans. Videos in between segments that we play and exactly. all kinds of stuff. Me doing weird stuff and sticking my hands places. We did an unboxing craziness. today yeah, an on unboxing. the live stream. Yeah. So uh, go over to jblive.tv on Sunday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. UTC, mm -hmm. jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Definitely. That's also, we'll, we'll be having all some live stuff from Linux Fest Northwest towards the end of the month, so you can catch that. Eesh. And uh, don't forget about Linux Unplugged. Yes. We do that every Tuesday. I think, well, oh, last week we had a we had a really robust yeah. conversation. We've had some great debates over the last couple yep. of weeks on Linux Unplugged. I shared my love for uh, uh, others in tech. A, tech, and, uh, a certain yeah. tech guy, yeah, as yeah. the word was. Cool. Hugs and kisses. Yeah, so uh, that was a great episode. And, and uh, don't forget about our subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. You can go there to help mold the content that fits mm -hmm. into the show. We take all of the input from there. It helps us fill out our news. We take a lot of the uh, uh, comments right. and discussion from there. Uh, we take a lot of uh, topic suggestions, run Linux suggestions, yes. all of that stuff in there. You can also just uh, have a dialogue with the community, linuxactionshow.reddit.com, and also our chat room. Uh, go over to irc.geekshed.net. That's the IRC server, and it's Pound Jupiter Broadcasting to get in our chat, which is going 24-7, seven days a week. All the time. Even when we're not live, but also, of course, when we yes. are live. And lastly, uh, don't forget to say a big thank you to our brand new sponsor, DigitalOcean. Use that promo code last Ocean. April to let them know that you're super excited to have them on the show because we want to make them happy and get them to stick around because we're really happy. We think they're an mm -hmm. awesome fit for the show. They run their entire business on Linux. And they contribute to open source projects, so we'd love to have them stick around. So use that promo code last April. Uh, that's just uh, you know something that could help. Good Let them stuff. know that you appreciate them keeping us on the it's air. Great value too. I mean, it's yeah, common. yeah. All right. Well, that wraps us up. Don't forget you can contact yep. us. Go over to JupiterBroadcasting.com. Click that contact link and choose Linux Action Show from the drop down. Join us live. And that wraps us up, Matt. So I'll Ish. just end it with this. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Like that I could see the developer's personality come through like yeah. the dialogue boxes. Like, yeah, just take care of it. Okay, show me. <laughs> right? Let's do yeah. this. Like, these right. are some of the button options. I'm like, okay. I love that. I yeah. love that. And it's little things like that. The installer, yeah. um, you know what? I'm going to forgive it. I think it needs help, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, I'll forgive it. I'll forgive so it. So the installer thing, like, it I could think be the a philosophy thing. is, is yeah. because it's a rolling release, you really only install once, and so they don't have to, they probably That's don't probably what think about spending a lot of time on it. Yeah. But I think the reality is, is that people get new computers, and they need to <laughs> install all their distros over again yeah. and so 
I, I mean, because of the, all the installation problems we had with the NUC, I spent so mm -hmm. much time in that installer that I started to hate it. Right. Like, I was just like, I am yeah. so sick of this installer. Yeah, yeah no, I give you that. I, the only reason why I was giving them a pass on the installer is simply because I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to assume they have limited people yeah. resources. Yeah. They're, you know, boutique shop. They yeah. may not have enough people to make that happen. I'm going to forgive that. But the, yeah. but the package thing, that's doable. Hell, but I see, that's that. where I go back to focus. You know? And I think focus answers your th what you're saying, too, is yeah. I think if they focus on a core set of things, yeah, yeah. this is an experience that we deliver. It only does these things. If you want right. more, there's meta packages you can install. But this is an XBMC machine. It has just what you need to play back yep. video codecs. We've enabled 3D acceleration. Here's Xbox Media Center. Have at it, Haas. If right. you need anything else, you have to install a meta package. So here's how I see it. Uh, GNOME and KDE, everything, everything. And then you got like XSCE minimalist, and then you got uh, uber minimalist when you go to like uh, you know uh, uh, like uh, Steam Big Picture mode and whatnot. Yeah. So I think you could really kind of that that's a nice compromise I think for the people that want it all, but at yep. the same time maybe for those other things they don't. Yeah. You know it's it's and it's totally doable with their existing manpower. It really would be. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh no no! Just couldn't make it in time. Saw it coming. This computer on. Whoa! And this. What is all this? What stuff? is all These this? Are the parts that make up an Apple computer. Oh, we're uh, in an Apple computer. Wow, you're standing like an Apple on it. Oh, sorry. It's called the easy. microprocessor, and it's uh, the pretty much the heart of the computer. <laughs> no. Kind of the moderator of the talk show that Ooh. goes on. And these two oh, chips sorry, down here. Sorry, buddy. Are in bad. Wrong. <laughs> Screw you, Apple! Here we go. All right, here we go. There we go. This is what it is. Dun dun oh my God, that's awesome looking. This is called the Apollo. Clearly, this is gonna be a night at the Apollo. I mean, this is like really, that's cool looking. God, it's just the, even the knobs look killer. All right, there it comes. Here it comes, Matt. It's so big. It's beautiful and it <laughs> smells new. <laughs> I love that new smell. It's got that new car smell. Uh, dun dun. Uh, 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 dun 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 dun. Apollo. <laughs> so uh, this is a compressor and a gate and. Uh, um, an okay. equalizer and a normalizer and a mixer all in one. You're you know? saying you finally found a device to make me normal? Yeah. Not that kind of normalizer, man. Oh! There we go. Boy, it's a good looking machine, I'll tell you that. Tell you what, chat room. And then, uh, there we go. We got, uh, so there's the front right there. And uh, on the back, Ooh. we have our audio imports oh, and our crap. firewire out. And it will be replacing this big Mackie mixer right here. If all goes as planned, and that Mackie mixer will get uh, promoted to another job. You know, this happened years ago too. But you know, you know when I started really realizing I was getting old, is when I would see uh, a mom with young kids, and I would <laughs> be like, "Oh, I bet she's about my age. Like, hey, let's check her out." And, oh, wait a minute! I'm now using the fact that she's a mom to know that she's in my age group. <laughs> So that's my so this is an HTML5. Uh, this is literally the console of the screen. You can see here's some here's some uh, when I was effing around with BitTorrent Sync. You can see it here dying off right okay. there on the console. So this is really really freaking handy for a remote droplet. No plug-in needed. Just it's an HTML5 uh, VNC thing. That's so cool. Bad idea. Oh shade. Total bad idea. Oh, what was I thinking? Tactical error made. Oh no. All right, that's that's all right. Come on, don't lose the sun. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Keep going, keep going. Come on. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. No! Get to the chopper! Hold on, I gotta scratch my ear. <laughs> oh! <laughs> what okay. the heck is in me? Yeah, you guys missed the unboxing already? Jeez, maybe I'll put wow. it in the outtakes. Yeah, I might have Jeez. to do that. Jeez. All right. Okay. No, this silliness. <clears throat> <clears throat> ah, ooh, okay. Oh! Ruga. 